Welcome to, to our webinar. Glad to see uh, so many people joining and showing the interest uh, to know a bit more about, uh, about OMS. So just some um, sharing with you the content that we're going to be displaying today throughout uh, the webinar. So we're going to go through some key principles, some of the OMS key principles. Um, we're not going to go into, into much details as well as uh, change request process that we're going to see afterwards because this is uh, we have we held a dedicated webinar with very extend with a extensive content on this matter. Um, you can access uh, the content. The recording is available on on YouTube. This session will also will also be uh, recorded. Um, and we, as I as I mentioned before, we're going to be using a separate platform. Uh, where you can log in um, any questions that you may have throughout uh, the presentation. So, um, starting with uh, OMS uh, key, key principles. So, um, the OMS service, um, as some of you may know, supports the implementation of the ISO ID, IDMP standards. Um, this uh, happens by providing a single source of validated organization in all its location uh, information um, so that it can be used uh, as a reference to support uh, regulatory activities and other uh, business processes. Um, this happens uh, following the need for the, a better organization data uh, and to, initial, to initially build our dictionary, we actually use uh, five uh, internal sources, one of them being uh, XCVMPD, other, for example, being uh, other GMDP. Uh, but, of course, we count with the users uh, to help us maintaining our data, making sure that what we have uh, is up to date, and this happens through uh, uh, change requests. We're going to go into further detail, but just some initial uh, points. Um, now, uh, what do what what is OMS? So OMS is uh, hosted by EMA. We we here we in in the agency we maintain we are the ones responsible for uh, mastering the data. Uh, this uh, our dictionary is a public dictionary and is accessible to anyone that have access to our uh, link to the SPORE, to the OMS uh, portal. Um, OMS provides a source of organization and uh, its locations, its physical locations, to be used as a reference information. Um, the concept of an organization. We will create an organization. We create an organization in OMS uh, if this record exists as a legal entity, and we will add all its physical uh, locations within a certain jurisdiction, within a certain country. So if one record um, actually exists with the exact same name registered as a legal entity in two different countries, we're going to have two org IDs. So we're not talking about the same record, even though they share the exact same name. They have different organization IDs. They have different location details and, of course, different uh, log IDs. The representation of other business names, they can also be captured in OMS. However, they will always be ref referred to the main legal entity. So we can add any business names under the alternative names in OMS. However, um, the main organization name is going to always be the legal entity, the, le the legal entity name that we have in a certain uh, country. The organization, the organization data is structured um, with unique IDs and is mapped to some some source systems that we have, as I mentioned, one of them being other GMDP, and we actually held some of those site reference IDs in our 
in our portal. Um, the reason for this, and I, I'd like to hear to share with you one case um, that actually came to our attention while mastering this other GMDP records, uh, as I mentioned, because in OMS we held only legal entity um, organizations as legal entity. For example, in other GMDP, we could see other details that those details were not captured as a legal entity in the tra local trade registry. And for the reason, in this example that we see here in front of us, this is what the reflection you will see in our portal. So as you can see, we have mapped to all these site IDs, the ones that of course have reference to the same data, so organization and location. As long as the data, the details are the same, this, um, this is the way the data will be displayed and mastered in OMS. This location ID, they're going to be unique, even if a certain physical address is used by a different organization. So what do I mean with this? We can have um, the same physical location actually being used by all sorts of organizations, but what is important is not only the location, the details of the location, is also important the relationship with its organization. So when in this case that we have five records that actually represent the same physical location, but, but because they are um, used, they are being used by five different uh, legal entity types, for that reason, a new lock ID will be generated. Another very important point, which is that in OMS, uh, we do not differentiate between um, an organization that may be used in a human context or in a veterinary context. All organizations will be captured the same way. We do not uh, distinguish any roles in the same way um, that we do not um, assign, we do not classify an, a record as being a market authorization holder or as being a sponsor, as a manufacturer, this classification need to be handled uh, locally in the consuming system, at the consuming system level. In OMS, we will, the goal of OMS is to create a, a standard dictionary to be used in all sorts of uh, regulatory procedures. And as we know, uh, the same record can actually be used in a veterinary uh, procedure as well as in a human and when we go into the detail that the same organization can can be a market authorization holder or can also be a manufacturer and for the reason OMS only provides the list of organization and location the rules they will be captured at consuming system level. OMS as the name say, he manages organizations, so we do not maintain, we will not create any individuals in our dictionary, unless of course they are registered with the local authorities. We have cases, we have organizations that are registered in OMS that in reality are um, individuals, but we have it in OMS because they are registered with the local authorities. This is going to be the only exception in the only cases where you can actually see individuals in OMS is when they are indeed registered with um, the Chamber of Commerce of a certain country. And last but not least, in OMS, uh, again, in the same context, uh, we maintain legal entities, so any department information, any business unit information, it will not be captured in OMS. This information is a different granularity of information, and by, the, by so it should be captured at consuming system <coughs> level. Um, in OMS, we have a versioning uh, to all the records that we update, that we change. Um, 
the version, you can identify those versions uh, in the format of a timestamp. So it's not version one, version two. This is all visible in accessible through in our portal through the export functionality. You will see it indeed a timestamp um, as a version uh, as a format of the version. Um, in OMS, we will always, very important, we will always publish the latest information available. So we were not going to go back to update a certain record that reflects today reality to revert to a, a previous version. So OMS always maintain and always capture the latest information available. Of course, if there is something that may be outdated in our in our portal, um, we we appreciate. We're glad to receive a change request, indeed, to update and to make sure that uh, we have the latest information available in our portal. Now, link with this, um, who can change the date in OMS? So, to this, there are only two. There are only there is only one requirement, which is. For you to be able to change data in OMS, you need a SPORE role, regardless if you are a, an NCA, if you are an industry, regardless if you are a super user or if you are a user. The important, the key message here is as long as you have this SPORE role, you can change, uh, for example, you can change, you can add a location, to the organization that you belong, but you can also create a location, for example, uh, under a, a manufacturer that already exists. You can create a hospital in our dictionary. If you are a simple user, you can create a different manufacturer. You can update or you can create a location within an organization that you are not affiliated to. This is done on purpose, okay? The purpose is to facilitate and to make sure that everyone can access our dictionary. Now you ask, okay, but this doesn't seem very safe. I understand your concerns, but bear in mind that behind, this is just the interface that the user see. Behind, we have a validation process. I'm gonna go through this later on in the presentation. Um, but bear in mind that, of course, uh, for this validation process to go smoothly, we're going to re it's required to submit supporting documentation to help us attest uh, the veracity of the data, the request that is uh, in front of us. So for that reason, uh, every time there is a change request submitted to OMS portal, it's required to submit a uh, to submit a supporting documentation so that the validation process can go uh, smoothly. Now, I would say that the biggest principle of them all, I know there were quite a few, but um, just to tell, and please keep this in mind, that OMS is supposed to provide a standardized list of organization and location details. OMS is not going to provide a copy of the data that you that the organizations may have with the trade registry within uh, manufacturer certificates. No, this is not the goal of OMS. OMS have um, a data quality standards document. The rules are published, and we every time we master the record, every time we have a change request, the data will be published following those rules. Okay, our our goal is and why do we need you ask why do we need then the supporting documentation? Supporting documentation is just to help us verify um, indeed that the request it's real, that the organization exists. We're going to use that document to verify with the business registry, with Dunn's website, with, with our source information. If the, a certain legal entity exists as a, is a, a certain organization actually exists as a legal entity and that we, so that we can uh, 
do the correlation with all its uh, locations. The locations, of course, and this is something that we're going to see afterwards as well, they're going to be mastered and standardized as well. Not We do not do the standardization only at organization level. Standardization also happen at the location uh, level. Okay. So, in a nutshell, uh, how do we do this? So, we've talked about change requests, we've talked about documentation, standardization, validation. Okay, now putting all this content, all this context together. So, this is what we get. Um, upon the registration of both organization, a new organization, or even creating only uh, a location, there are two main steps, validation and standardization. First step being validation, where we use indeed the documentation that you provide. We validate against our sources, our sources uh, being always depending if we're talking um, an organization that is within an EEA country or in case it's outside we will be we may be using uh, the DUNS website as a source validation of information. After we validate and not only the existence of the data but also the relationship between organization and location, we are we are free to go and we can indeed uh, register data in our dictionary. Of course, now there is a second step which is standardization for organization name. Uh, we're going to use our OMS data quality standards for each country. Uh, we're not going to change the meaning of the data. So imagine that you have a company A uh, LTD registered within the business registry. When we apply our data quality standards, we need to verify what we how do we standardize this data. And it may happen then instead of farm uh, company A uh, LTD, we may register the record uh, following our data quality standards. And if in our data quality standards we have that there a certain in a certain country LTD should be captured as limited, this is the only change we're going to perform. We're not changing the meaning. We're not going put. We're not going to create the record in our dictionary as company A uh, public or uh, we're not changing the meaning. We're just standardizing the data. This is, as I said, happen against data quality standards. At location level, we actually have uh, at the back end the support from the National Postal Service. So in our, in our uh, system, we have embedded a tool that has files I, and I think we can, I will explain uh, in more detail in the next slide, but just to say that we have in our tool information from uh, more than 200, 240 postal service with all the details on how should we maintain an address. So if uh, what uh, details should be captured in address line one, what is the correct city, what is the, post, the correct postal code, is there any sublocality information relevant that need to be there? So this is all we have the support from the National Postal Service. Of course, we have exceptions. One of them, for example, being the PO box, that those are not recognized by the National Postal Service. To those exceptions, we follow uh, the rules that we have, again, in our data quality uh, standards. Now, going um, into more detail, to what uh, is this library that we have. Um, so uh, the, with the commercial name being Address Doctor. So this Address Doctor is, as I said, an address, li address library used um, f as an address uh, validation. It also helps, help us uh, correcting any, any typos, for example, and Last but not least, it helps us standardizing uh, the data. This is the goal of OMS. This is the crucial step. So um, it's a worldwide system populated, as I said, with reference covering more than 240 countries. Um, 
is the only service uh, that combines postal certification in one engine. So we have the certification from five global postal organizations, um, which give us uh, a more comfortable um, way to work with the system because indeed it's widely uh, certified. Uh, this system helps us uh, standardizing the data and formatting uh, the locations according to the local um, postal standards. This way we ensure that the, um, the correct elements will appear in the correct fields and the correct information uh, will be there. Um, these references uh, that we have in our tool is updated throughout the year, several times during the year. Um, and this, this tool help us uh, enriching addresses. Um, also, we geo, we geo coordinates. Um, and in addition, it also help us uh, with different character sets, such as Greek and even Japanese. Uh, this means that uh, when a location is actually recognized by the National Postal Service, the data of course, the main location, the main data will always be maintained in English, but a local language uh, address, a child location, will be created and added uh, to the dictionary. Okay, now moving on into our uh, processes and um, exactly what we do, uh, all, the, all the ways we have to, up, to update uh, the data. So we have the user as a as a, a central point. So the user uh, have access to to reach us and to update the name, the the details of the, our dictionary through change request tasks. This is the functionality available um, via OMS portal. In the same way, uh, the users can also reach us through. Uh, service desk. So these are the only two gateways that the users see, but this is just a small part of everything that we as EMA uh, data stewards do. So change request is one of the data stewardship tasks that we do. So apart from the change request, we also have some data services where we, we perform some mapping activities, ETL tasks, delta tasks, merge tasks, their whole scope of tasks uh, captured uh, under this <laughs> data service and data stewardship. Apart from, the, apart from the mastering of the data, we also have a different module, which is the data quality management, where after the data is created, we maintain a, and we con control tightly everything that is created and to make sure um, that we have a good quality of the data. Uh, I will show you some, um, some, some numbers on this um, in, in the upcoming slides. I think it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, apart from the data quality, there is a, still a third big module, which is uh, the service desk. The service desk, of course, being another gateway we have to contact with the OMS uh, user. Uh, using the service desk, um, we have all sorts of uh, classifications that we can address those calls. So we can have um, data quality incidents, we can have the, the IT incidents that ourselves being uh, part of the business team, but there are some uh, incidents that we may need to, to handle, to work with. We can also answer some data quality questions using this platform and some general questions. All these through all these three major uh, scopes, we can, this is just a gateway that we use, of course, to work with our SPOR key user group. Uh, so we use this SPOR key user group and it's something that we <laughs> I will also show you later on, on the data governance of, of this group and what, do, what can we do with this group, what is the goal of this group. Uh, but in a nutshell, to tell you that 
um, from any of these three processes, we can identify data quality issues. We, this is the, the place where we discuss n uh, the possibility of developing or the need uh, to develop new business rules. And of course, last but not least, the development of new guidance that can, of course, provide uh, a better uh, user experience. Um, now, I would like to share with you, now that we have a big picture of everything that we do, I'd like to share with you a bit um, a bit more of what we have been doing, uh, what is the share that each of these activities represent on our on our day to day, uh, how many of these requests do we handle, starting with a very general <laughs> overview of uh, how our dictionary has evolved since 2020 to 21. As you can see, there was a significant increase in our dictionary. Uh, this was mainly uh, due to the mandate use of OMS in EAF, as well as um, while pre preparing for the upcoming mandate of OMS in UPD other GMDP and with uh, clinical trials. Um, starting with the tasks uh, that indeed have a big visibility and a direct impact on the current uh, regulatory procedures. Um, we have would like to start with the change requests. So OMS went live five years ago and uh, throughout the time, uh, I think we can we have been improving and this is of course a work in progress but last year we noticed a significant decrease so we had three times more um change requests compared with the previous year um and this of course as i mentioned was uh, due to not only the mandate use in EAF but as a preparation of the upcoming mandate in uh, UPD clinical trials and uh, other GMDP. Um, but I would like to share with you and uh, also uh, to reinforce this uh, part, this last bit, that even though with this increase, I'm happy to communicate that uh, we were able to address all the requests in the agreed timelines. Um, this is very important to us and to, to share this information with you that Indeed, we were able to, we, we acknowledge there was an increase, but we're very happy to communicate that we were able to handle them <laughs> in, the, in the agreed uh, timelines that we have published. Uh, but of course, our priority is to make, uh, to improve <laughs> the customer experience. And I think there's still, we think that there's still space uh, for improvement, even though majority of our change requests uh, are being approved. Our focus and our goal for this year is uh, to, um, to work on the reduction of the rejection change requests. We notice already an improvement from 2020 to 21, significant improvement, um, but this is something that I would like to continue. Of course, this is a necessary work both for the requester and for the EMA uh, team. Um, how did we manage to do this reduction in one year? So this was thanks to the support and collaboration with the key user group, where uh, we indeed, we did a major improvement of our manual, of all our manuals, our guidance as well. We delivered um, two webinars last, last year, which I think it was also a very positive and indeed <laughs> in the, we see it in the numbers. Uh, in the future, uh, and having in consideration the statistics, the numbers that we saw on the rejections, we see that majority, uh, it's still due to the missing supporting documentation. We are planning to deploy a new functionality 
a simple warning message that every time a change request is submitted without the supporting documentation, the user will be prompt with a <coughs> within with a, a small window, a small warning telling advising the user to submit to attach a supporting documentation. Uh, otherwise the likelihood of rejection will be will increase. Um, <coughs> When we look at the change requests alone, we I think we already have a significant number of tasks uh, in front of us. Uh, however, this may seem indeed a big number, but this is only um, one way we manage uh, the data. When you look at the numbers performed throughout the three main scopes we identified before, we can see that indeed is a very small part <laughs> and we have actually a 10 of um, the core of our activities and the core of time that we have spent, which is in data services. These data services is the tasks that I mentioned before. We're talking about merges, ETLs. So this, um, in the last year, this was due to the to the preparation or the integration with the other GMDB where we manage considerable number of records in a very tight deadline. <laughs> we also provided support to NCAs with the mapping exercise, integration, a weekly integration with uh, internal uh, SAP um, accountant um, system. Um, and last but not least, our data quality assurance. So um, this is, um, I will show you afterwards a few examples on exactly what is this, but just to tell you that uh, data is constantly being updated. The data that we have today is a non-static data because by, until now our focus was to indeed to integrate, to make sure we had all the records. From now on, our goal will be to review and to standardize and to make sure that all the rules, all the data quality rules that we are advertising, they are being followed in our uh, in our dictionary. And in, of course, in case we need any adjustments, in case we see and we identify, we target that there is a gap and that we haven't reflect a certain um, a certain exception. For example, this again will be taken to the key user group. It will be discussed, and it will go um, into the the process. Um, And uh, now that we've seen change requests, we've seen data service, we have a very small, <laughs> it seems a very small scramble there, but it's also um, very important for us, which is the service desk calls. We also had uh, an increase comparing with the previous year. Um, However, when we look at the big picture, we see that this service desk calls, the increase was not proportional in regards with the other two scopes. So we are happy. Uh, we were very happy. We we're very pleased to see this. I think it means that we're doing something right. <laughs> Otherwise, I think they will be exponential and we, we would have the same increase that we having uh, in change requests or even in data service, we would it would be visible um, at service desk level. Um, the SLAs, uh, of course, uh, they were they were still they were still met. We were able to answer within our average uh, SLA. However, at the beginning of the year of last year, we had a major system upgrade which limited a bit uh, our IT support and some of those tickets may have been uh, deprioritized indeed because the technical team was focused on uh, working on the deployment uh, but we try uh, of course always to address um, 
to address the calls uh, as soon as possible and within the um, our SLAs. Um, okay. Um, in terms of customer satisfaction, we actually um, launched a survey at the end of last year, and we we're very pleased to see the result of this. Uh, we got very uh, good uh, classification from our users. We had 200 uh, and close to 230 uh, responses. Uh, to most of them, 91% 90, actually displayed a satisfac satisfactory um, a grade to our service, both at uh, data service and at data quality. We're very pleased uh, to, to see this. Um, and uh, also to having all these into, into account and doing a, a, a bridge with the next uh, module, which is going to be on data quality management. Also very good to, to see that indeed, in the year of 20, in the last year, we've identified uh, 78 data quality incidents. However, when we when we do uh, the calculations and we divide this by all the dictionary that we have, all the locations that we have, or even if we 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 do the calculations, the percentage of data quality incidents reported by user, as you can see, we have a very small. Uh, we were very pleased to see that we have a very small uh, percentage of those data quality incidents actually being uh, reported. Now, um, exactly continue on this on this topic on the data quality uh, management. So just to tell you that we have um, two main ways to do this one being proactive and the other a bit more reactive. So this reactive is through the service desk uh, ticket. This is the main gateway, not only the not the only one, but this um, one of them being the data quality incidents. They are reported through service desk. Um, the other more proactive, which is through activity-based monitoring. So to every task, that we perform, we do a sample uh, of 20% of those tasks. We do a quality control uh, on, the, on that small sample. And once we do the quality control, we still do a quality assurance of that, of that same sample. And it's through this quality assurance that it helps us um, identify um, any defects that we may have, any process improvement that may be requirement, any root causes to a problem that may be requirement that may be required. Uh, this is the even though it's not something that the user may see on the day-to-day -day basis, but this is very important to us to maintain and to assure that the data that we have, the data that we are asking the users to use and that more and more systems nowadays are using, indeed that they have a good quality um, of the data so that indeed we can have a more reliable and more users being able to use and to rely uh, on this because what we do at the back end indeed I think is big enough to provide some um, some reassurance that what we have is not uh, it has indeed good quality. Um, another proactive way uh, to to do this uh, data quality uh, maintenance um, is through uh, a different system that we have. It's a data profiling system. So I will show you um, in a few slides. Um, this is very important. Once we establish our data quality rules, we can create a, a simple dashboard that helps us monitoring. So every time there is a record, even though they do not appear, we, you may say, but imagine that you have a record that was created wrongly 
and is not following the, the data quality standards and you do not capture them here. Yes, if we do not capture them here and if they are not following our data quality standards, they will be captured in our profiles. And this is the way, another way we have um, to maintain indeed the good quality of, of our data. Of course, uh, we acknowledge that not everything is perfect. We acknowledge this and we have uh, established acceptable um, threshold that I'm very pleased to say that we are way above them. <laughs> um, so um, we mainly categorize two, um, two type of errors. One being uh, the major errors, the, the ones that actually affect, may affect the data quality of our, of our, of our data, and some minor errors that may uh, that have an effect, affect the, that may affect the process uh, that we need to capture. Uh, but both of them are equ equally important to maintain and to uh, monitor. Um, now. Uh, how does this work in practice? Uh, what do you, how do you, how, how do we assess and what exactly does this mean? I understand that may be a bit tricky, but putting in a different way. So um, the data quality incidents, the reactive way that we, we talk. So in the whole world of the service desk that, uh, I show you before. So we actually had 78 incidents. They were all corrected. They were um, all fixed. Uh, aside from these data quality incidents reported, so we did uh, um, a sample of the whole service desk uh, calls that were created, to which we found indeed two majors. Um, but those two majors when, were indeed due to the missing supporting material. So it was not because we provided the wrong cost, the wrong answer. It was indeed, um, we, as you can see, we have very tight rules when we, we classify as a major or as a minor. And as you can see, when we, by a simple, if the data steward forgets, which was the case, in two tickets, the data steward forgot to attach the supporting documentation. This is considered a major error because it, it ended up generating fr frustration to the user and it's double work uh, and we don't want this to, to happen. This is, our, this is our goal, is to eliminate this to zero. But I think um, so far, I think it's a, it's a very good outcome. Uh, so this is service desk wise. When we talk about um, the other two scopes of uh, data stewardship, we're talking uh, change requests and data service. As you can see, the size of it, it's uh, very different. <laughs> uh, but of course, we do a sampling um, proportionally. So when we assess, we assess the same 20%. And uh, we have for, for the last, last year, we have identified some major and minor errors, which we corrected. <laughs> And to those that uh, actually may question the rules that we have, they are all rather if they, regardless if they're coming through one of, while mastering the data or through service desk, if there is something that uh, may need to be reviewed. So this is all captured as a data quality defect and is later on brought to the attention and to discussion to be discussed with the QSA group, uh, where we're going to further uh, discuss, trying to understand if our rules need to be updated, if there's something that we need to add to our rules to uh, indeed to capture uh, that defect that we, we, we have, that we haven't identified uh, recently. I can give you an example that actually happened uh, this year which was uh, the Swedish uh, postal addresses. So 
until now we were not able to identify the postal address from Sweden. So it's a very specific case where you only have, you don't have a PO box. The way you have is you have actually the postal code and the city, and that is all the, all the information you have there. So this came uh, from several change requests. It was captured as a data quality defect. We discussed it with key user group, and after multiple discussions and consulting with uh, uh, local authorities and with colleagues from uh, other regulatory procedures that help us uh, with their support, we indeed we implement this new rule, and the data quality standard is now um, capturing that rule exactly uh, to accommodate. And I think this is a very good example. This was actually um, happened very quickly, um, so it's a matter of uh, if we see that there's something that does not is not making sense if we manage to build the case, we'll take it to, of course, to support user group and happy to discuss. And if relevant, we will include, we'll need to update our data quality standards to make sure we have the best uh, quality of the data and the data with the best quality, better this way. <laughs> um, another proactive way we have to monitor our data quality is, as I told you, through the data profiling. So <clears throat> those profiles, uh, they are built uh, every time there is a new business rule created. So um, this is a constant uh, monitoring and is a, it's a constant development of new scorecards because, for example, for the case that I just shared with you, every time there is a new defect it goes to discussion with the key user group we need to update the data quality standards and a new profile need to be created because from now on we have a new rule we need to monitor it we need to keep a close uh, a close eye to that rule to make sure that from now on uh, any any record that fulfill the same requirements will have the same standards and will be published uh, the same way now, um, <clears throat> uh, just to show you just a screenshot uh, what exactly is this data profiling. So uh, just to share with you here uh, two examples, one of them being um, the OMS accuracy uh, uh, scorecard. So in this case, as you can see, we have uh, multiple countries. We ha we need to build one per country because the rules applicable to each country are different. In this case, we're talking location because they have they each national postal service have their own rules. In this case, you can see that we have here one country which is Ireland that is looking very red. <laughs> is not the ideal. We know that we have those errors, we know they are all captured under these profilings. This is not, I can tell you that this is not the only red we have there. But just to share with you, just to tell you that this is gonna be our priority for this year. And that's why we call it, we say that our data for the upcoming times, it may not be the most static information because of this, because we, our priority is always going to be given. We use those card cards to, product, to prioritize our work. So, of course, if we have a set of data that is looking red or yellow, that because there is a, 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 a grade to to this um, to each color that is assigned. So we start always with the reds because it's the one that have a lower a set of data that has a very low data quality. In this case, in Ireland, I can tell you that it's because uh, most of the addresses are not recognized by the National Postal Service, but especially because they are not recognized by the National Postal Service, we definitely need to review them and to understand why are they not recognized, what do we need to do, is it missing a postal code, is it missing a city, is it because the city does not have the right value, so is all this assessment and that we need to do while handling uh, this 
uh, score this data quality uh, profiling. Another example um, of a scorecard that we have or of a data profiling that we have, which is the organizations that are duplicates. As, as we saw before, uh, when we're talking about the duplicate, this is uh, actually a major uh, data quality uh, incident to us. So this is always our priority. Uh, it's monitoring this the organization we have in the same way we have for organizations. We have another dashboard for location and this is always uh, the one that we open every day to make sure Yesterday we did not create any 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 duplicates, and uh, we will afterwards go into the reds and the yellows, and starting afterwards with the greens with the lower score until we have all of them with a hundred percent score. Um, to every rule, to all of these small. So this that we're talking here, we're talking about a small, um, a small profile. So we're capturing a certain type of rule, a certain rule that we have in the data quality standards. But these rules, um, these rules actually um, aim uh, to add and to support um, a certain data quality attribute. Uh, so that we can have a generally overview. So to which profile that we create, we're going to assign under which of these data quality attributes it makes sense. So that at the end, when we want to have an overview of everything that we are publishing, we can have uh, a good knowledge of what we have there. Because we have so many small rules we need to monitor them, of course. This is how we correct them, by those individual scorecards. But we also like to have an overview because even though we can have, as we saw, we have a very red one there. But when we look at the full picture, we are very pleased to say that for at organization level, everything is uh, higher than 90% on the score, so very good quality. And the same is also visible at the location level. So this we're very pleased to show this. Uh, I think it shows the day-to-day -day work that we do and that we try um, to follow these rules and we try to maintain them and to keep them update, even though we acknowledge they're not perfect. And this is going to be our main uh, focus this year um, is to go through all of them and to make sure we reach a hundred percent in all of this. So next year, I hope I'm going to be able to give you an update and to be able to share with you that we have at least something very close to a hundred percent. No, just wanted to go um, because this is the main gateway the users have to update our dictionary. I just wanted to leave you a few key points to the change request process. Um, I'm not going to go into much detail, but I think it's important because this is uh, the way to update at the end. This is the way to update our dictionary. So um, this change request process, as I, I, I've been mentioning, actually happens um, in three stages, so the submission, the validation and standardization, and the outcome, approval or rejection. The requester can submit uh, all, times, all types of changes to the dictionary. They can add an organization, update any of the records, regardless of the affiliation, as long, of course, as the supporting documentation is provided. The supporting documentation is going to be crucial on the validation process. Uh, we're going to attest the veracity of the uh, of a certain record if it exists as a legal entity, if it's a real location and its relationship, it actually exists. And of course, afterwards, once this is acknowledged, we're going to standardize the data following not only our OMS data quality standards rules published, but as well following uh, the local 
national postal service standards about when we talk about locations. Um, in the last stage of the change request, which is hopefully going to be an approval, and when we're talking an approval, the data will be automatically uh, published in our portal. Uh, if we have a rejection, uh, the user will be prompt with, um, with an explanation, with a small comment, and if applicable, further guidance on how to proceed to, to have a successfully change request approved with us. Um, When we talk uh, SLAs, uh, the, the SLA, it will depend on the type of change that the user is trying to submit. Of course, we always try to prioritize uh, the, any organizations that may be missing. So if we're talking other organization or other location, the SLA is going to be from five to 10 working days. When we talk, for example, of deactivation of a certain record, or a multiple change where we have a double validation that will be required, we the SLA it goes from uh, five working days to 15 working days. I'm happy to tell you. And as you saw before in our in our in our, my previous report, we are very uh, within our first threshold of the SLAs. We were about 99% of uh, answering them within the first uh, acceptable. Uh, timeline. Um, the change request process happens through the submission of a form. So just to, for those that haven't seen it, so this is the form. There are some uh, informations that are mandatory. The attachment, very important. The section to attach any supporting documentation, of course, Last but not least, you acknowledge that any information that's going to be published that you're going to add in the form is going to be publicly available, especially for when we talk, look, uh, look uh, e any emails and phone that you display here. I would advise you to use uh, some functional contacts because uh, all these will be made av publicly available. Of course, the Besides this change request information, this is confidential, is where we, you see uh, your own details. The update form, the form to update an existing record is very similar, as you can see. The only, th the main changes you see is that some, some fields will already be populated because uh, as the change request type says, you're updating a record. Um, going now into more detail on the attached documents. So we've, I've highlighted the importance of indeed of, ha of having the supporting documentation with the change request. So we have a special uh, guidance on this where we, we have an extensive list. We've, this was one of those documents that QZ Group helped us putting together uh, last year. So we have some uh, tables that depending on the, on the jurisdiction, depending on the type of organization, you're going to have uh, all the supporting documentation that we accept. So, for example, when we talk an EEA organization, we require uh, an extract from the National uh, Business Registry. Uh, if we're talking, for example, an hospital, a university, or a public entity, we acknowledge, we understand that um, uh, they may not be registered with the National Business Registry, and for the reason, the supporting documentation required upon the registration of those will be either a headed letter with the organization and location details signed and dated, or for example, we can also accept a GMP certificate um, with those same details. For a non-EEA organization, uh, we use as a validation source the DUNS uh, website, this is our main source. Of course, we, can, we will also accept any National Business Registry extract. In case this is none of the above are available 
uh, we will accept only in case they are not available, we will accept the GMP certificate and uh, last but not least, a headed letter. Of course, bear in mind that this supporting documentation by support by uh, adding a certain uh, supporting documentation we will not publish the data exactly as you have it in the document don't forget we have we will we not only validate the data but we will standardize the data this is all uh, a process that we have at the back end so and how exactly do we do this i'd like i'd like now to share with you two very basic examples one for organization and another one for location on what exactly is this so what how do we do this so i i grab here a case from uh, a british uh, company so we have um uh the requester submitted a change request as you see it in the screen. So the legal entity type uh, being type as LTD. Okay, fine. Um, for now, we don't see any issue. The second step is, do we have a supporting documentation? The user provided the required supporting documentation. This now, we will be able to proceed with the, val with the first step, which is validation. Okay, we acknowledge, we've, we verify with the company house, which is the Chamber of Commerce from the UK, that the document is it's still valid and that the organization is still active in the business registry. Once we do we, this validation step, uh, we pass this validation step, okay, we can proceed with the creation of the data. Now we need to standardize. And to standardize the data, we go to our OMS data quality standards, we see how are we supposed to capture this legal entity in the UK and the rules that we have there is that any organization in the UK, they can only be using limited publicly and EEIG. Of course, this is update, this document may need to be updated on the day-to-day -day basis, we acknowledge that. And if there is a new legal entity type that we will start be using in a certain country, we are, we of course, we're not going to point it out to a different legal entity type, definitely not. We, we need to assure that the meaning is the same. And if needed, we go again, as I've been mentioning, if needed, we're going to update our data quality standards to uh, make sure we have all the possible cases there. What we not, what we cannot do is create duplicates. So in this case, I would have to update the the name from LTD into Limited, and now the record was correctly validated only at organization level. The same process would have to be done now at location level to make sure. Both steps are green. So first we do the validation and then we do the standardization. When we talk location, as I mentioned, we have a big help from the National Postal Service, but this is just standardization. We first need to validate the data. This validation, again, is done against the supporting documentation and uh, using the national um, Using the local business uh, registry, we we verify that this is still valid, is still there. Of course, this is a case where we have uh, the location available in the business registry. In case we have a headed letter, we will it, it will always it will also be acceptable as a validation process. When we talk standardization, one of the requirements um, is that. There may be pieces of information that are not relevant to the post, to the National Postal Service. So the local authorities doesn't, do not recognize, for example, this case that we have another company um, in, the, in the address details. So the outcome of after we standardize the data, the outcome would be as simple as we would delete this extra piece of information. But as you can see, 
the details are the same. Address doctor, as you can see, the National Postal Service information was enriched with the GPS coordinates. Um, the address line one was slightly updated because we have a rule of title case. But as you can see, we did not change the meaning. The meaning is the same. The street is the same. The number of the street is the same city. Postal code is actually the same. It could be different in case the National Postal Service did not recognize. But the meaning needs to be the same. The same happen at organization level. Um, another case that may be tricky, and we have identified this especially after mastering the records from other GMDP, which is uh, the locations uh, with multiple door numbers. So for those cases, of course, we still have the validation process, but is when we do the standardization process, if those multiple door locations are not recognized by the National Postal Service, we will not be able to create one single location, one single lock ID to capture all these door numbers. This is very important to highlight. Um, what will happen then afterwards? So we will create as many locations as the you, you may need to your regulatory procedures. What we cannot do is we cannot create one single location that the local authorities do not recognize as a single point uh, in the map. Um, So in the future, this is how, for example, you would see a certificate. Of course, as I said, we can create as many as needed, as long, this is very important, as long as we do not create duplicates in the system and any outstanding, any um, further information, for example, when we talk other GMDP uh, certificate, this, because this is mostly... This is mostly visible indeed with the other GMDP. Um, with the recent integration, um, the, the, the colleagues from other GMDP uh, uh, appointed this as a strategy so that the inspectors will be able to capture and to understand that even though in the certificate we will only see the number 30, um, the inspection should actually accommodate from 30 to uh, 36. All this information will be captured under the remarks section. <clears throat> um, so after validation and standardization, uh, when we talk rejection, standardization does not exist. Actually, only validation exists. And uh, on the validation process, it means that it failed for some reason it fail, but the user will always receive two pieces of information. Um, rejection reason code, a small code uh, to what happened there, and the comment provided um, with a brief justification. So uh, why was it the change request not acceptable? Was it because it was missing supporting documentation? The supporting documentation, it was the wrong one. Was it because the request, by approving the change request, will be going against our data quality standards? So the user will always be prompt with a small comment and further guidance, if applicable. Be aware that, uh, unfortunately, for the time being, this is actually a work in progress, but for the time being, uh, we do not have uh, the return change request functionality. So in case uh, you realize that you've forgotten the supporting documentation or, or that you actually forgot to update the relevant data, um, we will not be you will not be able to submit a new request uh, only after we close the, pre the, the first one. So this may affect, of course, the ha this has impact on the SLA because you'll have to wait for us to close the first one so that you can submit the correct. So uh, when, you, when you're uh, creating a change request, please 
make sure that you do not forget anything so that you don't have any uh, further delays uh, on the um, on the process and what we always want which is the approval of a change request once we approve we validate the record and we standardize the data and we last but not least we approve the change request the data is automatically available uh, in our uh, dictionary and ready uh, to be used. Just to share with you in terms of OMS, uh, what is coming, what have we been doing, how do we integrate, how does OMS fit uh, within all projects that are happening in parallel and new systems that uh, uh, are appearing uh, recently. So, um, the strategy we use every time there is a, pro a project uh, ongoing, uh, the strategy we use, the goal uh, is to have OMS included in every regulatory uh, processes, uh, of course, throughout the life cycle of the medicine. And how do we do this? Is by onboarding and expanding our dictionary, our content. Uh, and this happens uh, hand in hand uh, with uh, integration um, and with um, with the integration both at content level but as well as a system uh, level um, as you know nowadays uh, many um, regulatory procedures are already successfully using uh, OMS uh, data this is it has start as I told, as I mentioned it started uh, we we went live five years ago and this has been a process an ongoing process um, we are already uh, or organ with OMS dictionaries already being used in centralized uh, procedures in um, in clinical trials the recent. Uh, the recent integration that we had uh, in parallel distributors. This was something that we did uh, two years ago. And also the recent integration uh, with uh, manufacturers, with the other GMDP uh, system. Uh, so this is what we have been doing. There's still work, there's still more to integrate with. For example, one of the systems that we would like to work and to have a daily synchronization, which is the SME database. We are also working uh, in implementing a daily process to make sure that everything that happened internally in the SME database, we will import into OMS so that they can support uh, other colleagues, for example, in the Irish um, platform uh, that where this information may be relevant, instead of having the colleagues going directly into SME, they would use only OMS as a main source of information. Of course, we are not assuming the responsibility of the SME um, colleagues, no. What we are is we're going to be only a gateway, so we'll be placing uh, the information from the SME database into OMS so that it can be easily accessed um, to any consuming uh, system. Um, just to leave you here um, a better overview when we talk about systems, I was actually talking about systems. Uh, indeed, uh, OMS is already being used uh, when we talk about the platform used for accessing, which is EMA account management, uh, as well as EV registration, both these use OMS. Uh, other, other, um, other GMDP is also using clinical trials, also using OMS uh, dictionary. Um, we have now a very complete an extensive list of systems already using and uh, in the future we're going to have new systems uh, on board one of them being daddy um, exactly we have it uh, which um, as some of you know it's planned already for q3 um, 
of this here um, but just to give you indeed just to leave you some informations um, on the impact uh, that OMS is having on all sorts of regulatory procedures so OMS is now um, used uh, in EAF for initial uh, market authorizations for variations all for any uh, centralized uh, procedures um, the same for uh, clinical trials UPD um, and the other GMDP uh, and in the future for 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 daddy of course this is a flow that um, it needs constantly it need to be updated constantly uh, because we and we are aware that we have more com we have more projects coming uh, it's even though we don't have those exact dates but we like to we keep an eye on them and we update uh, this uh, as we go to make sure that we support our colleagues with any uh, integrations uh, either technical or even data integration to make sure um, that we assure a smooth transition uh, both to the user and to our co uh, business colleagues. Um, Of course, a very important, and this is a message that I've been that I've been sharing, uh, that the OMS date is now mandate in all sorts of system uh, to highlight that, as you know, OMS uh, is a standardized list, and we will not have a copy of uh, the supporting documentation. We'll. As, the, as I said, it's going to be a standardized list of organization and location details. Any further information, such as manufacturing lines or department uh, details, they will have to be maintained locally at the consuming uh, system level. Um, we understand this can be a challenge. Uh, <laughs> um, OMS data... Uh, the, this is the challenge, not only to the systems, but also to us, because we we try to, OMS was introduced to create, because there was no, uh, it was a gap, there was no standardized list, and this is what we're trying to do. And, uh, of course, um, in parallel, we're doing, uh, with the key user group, for example, uh, to sm help smooth out this, this process and this integration by collecting uh, relevant questions uh, from users, a frequent, uh, and prepare a dedicated document uh, where we provide further guidance. Uh, and this happens in collaboration, of course, um, with each of these business units because each of them will have their own particularities. Of course, there are, uh, there may have. Uh, uh, difficulties across all of them but this we started we are actually starting um, with the OMS mandate uh, for centralized uh, products we started this and it's a work in progress we keep continue updating uh, in collaboration with the AF colleagues to make sure we capture uh, and we are able to answer and to provide the best com customer service to the user so that uh, you would easily overcome any obstacle that may appear uh, during your submission. Um, and uh, when we talk, there may be here a few steps that may seem a bit confused. And that's why I would like to share with you uh, our OMS governance. There are, when we talk, there are two main points um, that we need to, to separate when we talk about how OMS data is managed and how OMS data is used in each business process. 
who answer these questions. It's two totally different groups. I know it may be a bit confused, but they are to two different scopes. So when we talk how OMS data is managed, this lands in the scope uh, one of the groups that take actions uh, and address this these answers is indeed EMA data stewards um, through the tasks that uh, we have saw through the data quality management. Um, also key, key user group, a very uh, crucial group that help us uh, on the process, uh, putting data quality business rules in place, and as well any IT system changes that may be relevant. Um, when we talk uh, the how OMS data is used in each business process. In this, EMA, our OMS team does not have um, a direct link. So this is established by the business owners. So the business owners define the how to use the OMS data. So OMS, of course, OMS data stewards can can acknowledge, can assist with our how um, or with the rules on how OMS data is managed. Um, however, when we talk about how OMS data is used, that is a totally different, uh, a totally different matter. Um, of course, in terms of uh, business rules. This is, is, is a very wide group, it's a very uh, big group, and the business, we can change it. It can come from anyone. In this case, there is a re we put it here, a representation of a business rule that was updated uh, via a request from the EAF user group. So it's important uh, to share, to say that anyone... Uh, can make a proposal to our business rules. Of course, they are not going to be. There is a whole process that I uh, described already. Described. It needs first to go to approval to the key user group to understand uh, if they are to be indeed to be included in our data quality standards, or in case they are not uh, relevant uh, to us. Um, the integration we understand, of course, this is in a, in a line is in line with what I've been I've been discussing and what I've been uh, saying. Um, we understand that there are a lot of challenges, especially when we look at the new way to work. It changes a lot the way to work. But this is why we try to help. This is why we also try to organize this webinar to open the discussion um, and to to share with you as well what are we doing at the back end and to to share with you what we can do and what are also our limitations. And of course, one of them being how the, the OMS data is used because this is established by each uh, each business uh, process. Uh, so, in this case, just to show you, just to share with you a, a graphic view of uh, what changed um, when we talk about the recent integration with the other GMDP. So, in the past, um, NCAs uh, held the control of the list, so NCAs will be able to add, to update, and to create any organization and location uh, in the dictionary, um, using, of course, the inform they could be they could use the information provided uh, from uh, <coughs> from from the from the EAF applicants will be populating the EAF in an open field, there would not be any restriction there. Of course, with the integration, with the OMS uh, integration, 
what we have now is a slightly different <laughs> Uh, change uh, where we have is any organization data always come from OMS. So now this is the central point of organization and location details, both for EAF when a marketing authorization, an applicant or market authorization holder is uh, populating. Uh, a form, it will only be able to use OMS details in the same way as an NCA when uh, creating a new certificate. Um, it will only be able to to do it by using OMS uh, information. And the future. Uh, future OMS activities. I think I already <laughs> mentioned uh, the core of what uh, we aim to do this year, but this is not going to be the only, the only, our only focus for, for this year. So indeed, uh, our main goal is to continue with the data quality uh, improvement and to create better rules, especially something that we have in our pipeline, which is to create better rules uh, when we talk about those big plots and uh, multiple address locations. We understand there's still a lot of work to be done there um, to develop more uh, data quality rules, to have a better understanding and a more clear clarification uh, on how to use those rules. But we have other scopes. So uh, we have other projects at the back end. We also have here uh, an assessment that we'd like to do, but I'll, I'll take over this in, the, our, in my next slide, as well as uh, integration with uh, XCVMPD. This is something that we will help our, our PMS colleagues in the future, but to help them in the future, we need to start mapping and to start this cleansing uh, right now. And the SMEs, uh, just like I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, <clears throat> of course, this is our uh, prioritization for the upcoming uh, months, but the, the other activities, they will continue happening. Uh, data stewardship in the support through uh, service desk. Uh, our update, uh, there are some <clears throat> there are some rules uh, that would like uh, to improve. There's we acknowledge that there's still a lot of, a lot of work to be done in that sense. Uh, we already have a very good basis, but we still would like to improve uh, even more on this end, as well as our guidances, especially something that we have in our pipeline for this year. Uh, which is the, the the creation of a new OM, a new document, which is OMS uh, data management, where we we uh, discriminate more about merges, how they happen, what are the rules, what happens at the back end, what the user may not see, but in reality affects their day to day uh, work, and as I mentioned, uh, the development and the support other systems, other business. Uh, units developing and completion of new frequent uh, asking uh, ask questions uh, documents. We we think this indeed it helps a lot uh, the users. And last but not least, uh, we plan um, to do again the same that we did last year to to webinars and towards the end of the year. Um, launch uh, a new customer survey and it will be curious to see if what we change uh, compared with the, with the last uh, customer uh, uh, satisfaction survey that we did um, so now going back to the to that point that i left there still open which is um, something that we are still studying we are still trying to understand, because we acknowledge, we are the first ones acknowledge that it may not be easy. Uh, and now that we've helped and we concluded the work with the other GMDP, would like um, 
And of course, with the growing number of systems using the OMS, we understand um, that, and then CA is being required to you implement those, uh, our dictionary locally, would like to further assist and try to understand how can we do, how can we help NCAs indeed implement those, uh, our dictionary or understand uh, where can we help. Um, and for this, um, in relation to this, would like to, to ask for a group of volunteers to help us putting together a survey uh, so with this survey, of course, uh, is you through this survey, we're going to do an assessment, try to understand if it's something that the NCAs are interested, uh, is it, uh, and how can we OMS team help with those mappings? Would it be, would it, would you see more advantage to have it a monthly troubleshoot or would you see more advantage in doing only having our team supporting and providing you the mappings? Um, of course, all these will help us uh, with the assessment. Uh, we'll have to see how many NCAs will be interested in having the support, the volumes we are considering, the type of data each NCA may have. So all these questions we've put together, uh, they will be uh, crucial on our assessment, but this is why I would like to ask for some volunteers to making sure we, in this assessment, we have uh, a proper survey. We, we do not miss anything, and in case you have any other points that may be relevant uh, and may concern uh, NCAs and will help us uh, because our goal, uh, not only the NCAs, but we, OMS, uh, would like to support um, indeed with this implementation to smooth out the process. We understand there are a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, difficulties, and would like to at least to do this assessment and uh, try to do the best we can to support and to smooth out. Uh, this process.